This week I've got everyone's girl crush dietitian on, Harriet Walker. We're going to chat what to expect when trying to lose weight. Harriet, welcome aboard. Thank you very much for having me back, Greg. Always a pleasure. And what are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the ins and outs, expectations versus reality of weight loss. And I'm super excited to be chatting about this one. Let's rip in. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. Today's podcast is brought to you by Hydroxyburn Shred, Chaos, and Hydroxyburn Clinical, helping you smash your goals in and out of the gym. Hydroxyburn Shred is your daily thermogenic designed to blast stubborn fat cells, increase energy and suppress appetite. Need something to take your training to the next level? Chaos pre-workout delivers the strength, power, energy and focus you need to smash your next session. Want more? Stack with Hydroxyburn Clinical for all-day energy and to reduce the stress stopping you from losing weight. Just to mix it up today, guys, I'm going to do the intro just for funsies. So welcome to Body Science HQ, the house of fit, happy, healthy. And today I have with me Greg Young, GY, the OG, ready to talk to me about what to expect when trying to lose weight. Greg, and what Harriet, are you going to start with this? This is an interesting what to expect when trying to lose weight. And I threw this one out at you because that's probably one of the biggest questions that people ask when you get into an environment where people want to talk about their life. And, you know, it's... um. What do we expect when trying to lose weight? Well, let's let's be honest. It's not roller coasters, lollipops, and unicorns. It's it's a lot of hard work. No, I have very rarely gotten into a cab, had somebody ask what I do, and then not be subsequently questioned about how do I lose weight. It is a, a million dollar industry. It's a million dollar question, and unfortunately, Greg, I don't have all the answers, but I'm here to help. And the big thing here is, you know, it's all got to be about doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, you know, do we want to, like, what is a usual weight loss scenario that you get thrown at you in a clinical environment? Well, look, I, this is my bread and butter. This is what people come to me for and a lot of, you know, nutrition professionals mm-hmm. where we're very skilled in a lot of different areas, aspects of practice, but weight loss is the number one thing that people will ask us for in most cases. Because so. it's tough too because dietitians are sort of against the word diet these days, aren't they, which takes away a fair bit of what they actually do like and do you get asked a lot about weight loss well i think it's important to just sort of acknowledge that and you're private you're private too you're not in a you're no, not in a not hospital in a environment yeah, setting. So, i yeah, work in so, a private setting yeah. and, in, and in sports nutrition but for the most part um you know when people think about nutrition automatically you know there is a strong association with weight loss yep. but it's important to acknowledge that you can want to eat more healthily without having weight loss as the number one driver for doing so. And I think that gets lost in the message. Isn't it simply just drop the 1,200 calories and train hard? Nowhere. Well, <laughs> you know, my, Sorry, you know my, shoot it. <laughs> my opinions on the 1,200 calorie diet, which we can touch on in another, um, another topic. But look, the most uh, stereotypical scenario that I will put together for you, and this is probably, you know, extrapolating a little bit, but look, for most part, people are being over-restrictive. They're cutting out whole food groups. Um, they're labelling foods as good, bad, toxic. Um, and Instagram's not helping that at all. There's, oh, there's a few people that are pioneering the, the reverse of that, but it is really like people say, oh, carbs are bad, and, you know, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. there's like, lots of different camps, and that's what makes it all the more confusing yeah. for people. It's really hard to be objective about what you're trying to achieve. So let's be honest. Let's knock one of those out. Are any of these food groups toxic? No, no. Okay, so it's not toxic. So now we're going to look at good or bad. Good, bad. Again, that's a relative term. If I ate a kilo of broccoli every day for a month, there's a chance that I could end up in hospital because of overload of something, you know, and then the same you way. You want to talk about micro, micronutrients? No, micronutrients. Want to get to? Oh, no. God. <laughs> Let's not go down that rabbit hole. Um, but in the same direction, you know, if I ate a kilo of chocolate every day for a month, I'm also going to be putting myself at some kind of risk long term as well. Neither of those scenarios are ideal. Um, So you've just excluded the why not diet too. The hashtag why not diet um, is hopefully that doesn't really take off. So why why do we call foods good and bad? Look, I think it relates to like for first and foremost, you know, there are foods which eaten on a regular basis are going to have a protective 
benefit for our health. So, you know, there's a certain minimum of micronutrients, macronutrients we require in order for our body to function optimally. And long term, which we know reduces risk of certain diseases as well. So that's why we look at certain foods under that lens of, you know, disease prevention, um, good health short term and long term and well being. But we also need to factor in that not all food we eat for good health. There is a multitude of reasons that we eat, um, including for celebration, for sharing, for connecting, for showing love, um, for pure enjoyment, and none of those are wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, So when we're telling people that, you know, the (coughs) date night dinner that they had is actually bad for them or, you know, that that's that is like a really nice time for somebody to share an occasion with their partner, but then they're riddled with guilt because they've eaten foods that they've been told are bad or wrong, which inherently makes them bad or wrong. So there's a there's a unfortunately annoying middle line here. So where's this cherry picking information coming from? Like this, gee, that's bad. Like why do people think it's bad? Well, I mean, when you look at science in general, it is I can prove myself right or wrong in any scenario, depending on what I choose to take out from um, an article. So I could read a journal article on the benefits or the side effects of a specific nutrient um, and depending on potentially what my bias is or what I'm trying to prove right or wrong, I can put up a, a pretty convincing case depending on what me personally I want to achieve. So there's always biases whenever we're looking at any kind of nutrition information and otherwise, um, that we need to be aware of and the lens that we look at, you know, what are we, are we being objective or is it subjective information that we're sort of pulling out? I suppose you look at the scope of the research too, like they're not researching A to Z, they're picking something to research. Yeah, and, and the nature of research is, you know, you have to start somewhere use what you've got at that time. So, you know, nutrition is a science, um, but there's also a human factor to it, which we need to account for. You know, we're not robots. We're not test tubes. Um, We can have scientific evidence to show something that is good for us and is probably beneficial that we, you know, utilise that information. However, when we look at the individual who's applying that information, it might not be useful for them. So there's the, you know, scientific data that's available, but then there's also the real life application of that. And that's not always going to be practical for the person taking it up. So I might have information that I've, you know, read and it's just information until I apply it to somebody and I've applied it a number of times, that's when it becomes knowledge. So when it comes to diet, and dieting and trying to lose weight, we've got all of these various camps, you know, everyone's got, and they might have perfectly honourable motivations behind wanting people to take up their cause. Most people do, you know, they think it's, you know, they're doing the best thing by, you know, the the, the greater good by sh- telling this information. But we also need to acknowledge that um, sometimes, you know, the it can be a, a reduced um, lens that they're looking through and they might not be able to see that there's actually a breadth of information there that that needs to be considered before saying that this is the way to do one approach. So there are thousands of different dietary approaches we can take um, and some of them are going to be good for some people and terrible for others. So So what's giving us a parent motivation to start a diet? Where are we getting all this um, environmental awareness that we need to go on a diet? Well, I mean, I think it's a fairly common scenario where people want to be like smaller for some reason. You know, I'm not sure exactly the the sort of the science in terms of why we have that drive. Um, there's a, there's certainly a societal pressure to be smaller um, in some cases. I mean, not where I I'm from. It's always bigger the better um, in strength sports, which is why it's my people um (laughs) (laughs) however you know for the most part general population there's been this sort of trend of smaller is better um or you know looking a certain way which isn't on trend so these days you know in the 90s it was the you know waif thin kate moss look and then now it's probably having a bigger bum and having you know 
muscles and all that kind of stuff. There's trends in body in body shape, um, you know, with the rise of social media, with the rise of, um, you know, popular, you know, magazines and all that kind of stuff, influences, we're seeing something put forward to us and comparing ourselves to that and sort of checking, okay, am I, where do I stand? That's a human nature thing. We'll check where do I stand within my population do I need to make any changes? And that, you know, quite frequently leads to a want to lose weight. On the other side of that, we're in a world where we've got ample opportunity to consume calories in excess. That's led to scenarios where people might be carrying more weight um, in an unhealthy fashion and then, you know, that leading to impairments to their quality of life. Um, and they might have received information from a health practitioner or family member or something like that that's asked them you know that's advised them to to reduce their weight so there's a number of reasons you know some societal some medical um that leads people to want to lose weight but i think the manner in which we address it is the most critical part um in the in the picture um there is there are more positive ways to approach the endeavor and then there are some pretty um negative um in ways of approaching it and that's probably what we're gonna yeah so what what do i expect when trying to lose weight let's start there well i think the first thing is is setting time expectations and also um expectations of how much you need to lose in order to be, get the benefit of it not everybody first thing is checking you know for from health perspective do you actually need to lose weight and uh, there's a sort of subset of the population which we sort of call the worried well who might think that they're carrying an extra two, three, four, cu- you know, kilos extra and they'll be happier when they re- reach their generic number. And that's a person I would probably just be discussing healthy eating habits and improving their diet for quality of life and not torturing themselves to get down to a generic number. They're probably your five, two warriors at... Yeah, they're Eat the well who are, Monday to Friday, Friday night till Sunday. It's open slather. Let's have a crack. You know, there's, you know, there's. May have fallen that one myself a couple of times. <laughs> there's a too. lot of different patterns that we've got going on here. But, you know, and then when it comes to people who, from a health perspective, um, would benefit from um, reducing their weight because potentially their eating habits are not serving them well or. You know, they might be impairing their ability to move because of extra weight on their body. Then once we sort of figure that part out, you know, it it is of benefit for them to lose weight for quality of life. Then we need to figure out an approach that is realistic, respectful to the person and is focusing on food quality, diet, lifestyle, increasing exercise in a way that's positive rather than telling, you know, shaming people and rather than placing foods in good, bad, toxic and, you know, um, uh, driving those guilt, um, shame sort of feelings as a result of it. And I think it's really important, again, having a person that has the objectivity and the responsibility to be providing that information in um, the the most productive way possible. Um, so you're a qualified PT as well? That's yes. Correct. So someone comes in to see you if you're working at a gym and you're a PT and want to lose weight. Yep. Okay. Just take off the dietitian hat for a second. Mm-hmm. What should we as, as uh, industry leaders be telling these people that hit us on day one saying I want to lose? And, you know, it's never people don't really come in for one or two. I get told five and ten it's big numbers people want to hit every big time. Big numbers, absolutely. They talk. So what should a PT be looking at from a due diligence point of view in relation to engaging that person? Well, there's a certain level of training with general population nutrition that you get when you do your personal training qualifications. And that's really looking at, you know, the the quality of the diet, reducing, you know, your discretionary foods, your junk food, essentially, um, increasing your level of physical activity. As a personal trainer, the first place you're going to start is um, improving body composition, getting the person to be competently moving, getting them moving more and in a way that, um, you know, makes them feel good but is also increasing their energy expenditure. I find focusing on the performance factor over the burning calories factor to be far more constructive. Can you expand on that a little bit, what you mean by that? 
Well, I mean, there's two ways you can look at exercise. Yep. One is um, increasing your performance, which tends to have a lot more, when I say performance, proficiency, you know, hitting your PBs. Yep. Um, that feels good. When I say, go into the gym and I know that I'm about to go, I've been working up to hitting a 1RM on my deadlift because I've been focusing on getting to the gym regularly, hitting my training sessions, staying on my program. Um I feel good when I do that. My body feels strong. I'm respecting my body for what it can do. Uh, The other arm of that is when you are going into the gym with the sole purpose of burning calories, that gets super boring and super destructive really quickly. Like, um, you know, like I've burnt – you might want to know the data. You're like, oh, I burnt 500 calories in my spin class yesterday, which is, you know, cool, but – is it framing it in a way that's really going to lead to burnout? Because, you know, you get up on a 5 a.m. in the morning and I know I have to burn 500 calories. If I'm having a crappy day, my motivation to do that is going to be a lot – like my why is a lot less strong to burn 500 calories. Reframe it in a way that's more positive and conducive to um, – you know, good outcomes. Um, I'm gonna go get out of bed. I don't really feel like doing it, but I've got a, I've got a, you know, five k run I'm working towards, and this training session is one of the steps in that journey. My likelihood of actually getting out of bed to do that, I'm not gonna say stuff it. I can't be bothered to burn those calories. You're gonna do it anyway. I would prefer people to look at it at as a, in a way that's again positive framing as opposed to sort of <coughs> taking away from their. Um, well-being um, so the first place <laughs> bringing it on back the first place I'm looking at as a trainer is uh, working with the client on the reason why they want to do something yeah. it's, you know it's fine if you if you have the the goal to lose five kilos or ten kilos uh, if it's appropriate um, but we it would be really beneficial for the client to actually get super clear on, you know, you're always going to be burning calories exercising. How's about we put some performance goals on there to keep you motivated and to keep you, you know, appreciating what your body can do rather than focusing on the, you know, the side effect, which is calorie burn. You know, it just makes it a lot more sustainable, a lot more positive um, and it's goal-oriented and it, it's going to add to your life rather than take away because if anybody's run on a treadmill for half an hour waiting for the calories to tick by, it is a very miserable 30 minutes. Um, I've done it <laughs> and it's a long – a calorie is a very long time. But if I'm working on my 5K PB time, I'm, I'm motivated. You guys do a fair bit of psychology in a – Masters of Dietetics and Nutrition, don't you? There's an aspect uh, in undergrad, definitely yep. did. Um, I did a, a major in psychology um, and I did health psychology in my master's as a elective. Um, so did you touch on the fact of that person that's aiming at 500 calories, doing that extra half an hour on the treddy, what that does long-term in relation to their ability to fight the food? Like is there a stage in your head where you go, fuck this, the, I'm owed these calories now, I'm going to have that piece of cake? Like is there, is there a lot around... Um, look, to be honest with you, I'm, that's. Well, how does yo-yo dieting, like we all hear the term yo-yo dieting, like it comes and goes and comes and goes. What is it that creates a yo-yo? Well, look, without being a psychologist answering that first question. Okay, yeah, we're going to swim in our own lane. I'm swimming in my lane, but I will say. Go see a psychologist if you need one, everyone. Like, let's get that out there now, but let's talk about from a diet But I will say that it is. a trainer perspective. It is a mental um, pattern that yeah. I see really commonly. This is, you know, anecdotally from where I'm standing that people will go do their 5k run on a Saturday morning. They'll say, I've been being good. I've done the good thing. And now I'm going to treat myself. Um, and I'm going to have the croissant, which subsequently is wow, likely. Well, boys, we do it for beers just so like you can keep your croissant. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's um, boil that croissant down into a beer. <laughs> I'm going to treat myself and go and get a beer. Um, I don't actually even know how to order beer, Greg. I, yeah, a schooner, yeah. is it a pot? I'm not even sure. But anyway, that's an aside. But they're, they're you know, the the it's it's a it's a roundabout. People are doing a certain amount of work, and then they're kind of undoing their work by having that mentality of treating themselves with food with calories. When you look at the buckets we can expend energy from the the buckets from which we we burn energy, 
exercise, and I've said this before, is a fairly inefficient way to lose weight. We've got our resting metabolic rate, which is the energy required to live um, as one bucket. It's a very big bucket. That's probably about 70% of our energy expenditure is from just lying, being alive. Then we've got our... Um, so next time I'm on the couch and Sheree says, get off the couch, I'm doing my cardio. You're, no. uh, technically your heart Life is cardio. pumping. Yeah. So Breathing. there is <laughs> some element of truth to that. Um then we've got the thermic effect of food. So it costs energy to b- break down your food. We expend energy in that respect as well. Um, and then we've that's also... That's the old celery diet, isn't it? Uh, well, that's a myth. <laughs> myth busted. Um, and then we have our exercise-induced um, energy expenditure. We can split that off into two buckets. The energy we expend by moving, just by walking to the car, scratching our head, you know, fidgeting, that's that expends a lot of energy. You see those really tall, skinny people who've yep. got nothing on them, they can be quite fidgety. They're burning three, 400 calories a day by being a fidgeter okay. as opposed to the sort of slower people who don't move as much. They're not expending as much sort of non-planned uh, in a non-planned way. And then we've got our planned exercise, which is the exercise that we do for the hour or the two hours of training or the half an hour we might do. So we've got a few buckets of, you know, from where we can expend energy. Um, exercise is one that is a very small percentage of what we actually output in a day. So when people start looking at calories burnt, equating that to a food product and then you know that's that's when it becomes a pretty vicious loop of non-result um when we're doing that um so people so, are, so what why does um on that yo-yo dieting we, we, we mm. just talking about why does that normally result in more weight gain in, yeah in the long run that's a good question so we paint the scenario where i've taken my daily energy budget required for weight maintenance i potentially in many cases that I see, I've halved it. Mm -hmm. So I've halved my (coughs) calories required in one day in order to lose weight. Um, I've stuck to this for two weeks and I get to the sort of 15th day and I'm really hungry. My body is um, amping up the hormones that are associated with food, um, you know, food searching behaviour. So our food searching behavior, I've never heard of it put like that before. I have a lot of food searching behavior. Wow. <laughs> I'm looking for it. No, there actually is. Um, That's we, like a good craving. We get hormonal adaptations um, driven by starvation in essence. If I've halved your calories... I'm going to we say that's, talking. that's modern day. <laughs> we, wouldn't be talking. we wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's the modern day form of starvation. We're not going to starve these days. Food is plentiful. We can self-impose starvation and a lot of diets out there do that quite effectively. There are adaptations. Um, it's going to be a really plain thing mentally too, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. You know, it is, we're depriving people of the nutrients required to, you know, run their brain efficiently. Yeah. So everything's running on half. Um, and resultingly, we see these sort of milieu of hormonal and, f- uh, you know, physiological and psychological changes, which are actually driving us to eat more. So we get some adaptations, which include... Um, increase in drive to eat, so food searching behaviour, so the hormones, leptin, ghrelin. Um, we've talked about these before. So leptin is our satiety hormone, I'm full. Mm-hmm. Ghrelin is our hungry hippo hormone, um, I'm looking for food. So leptin tends to go down because we, we've potentially um, also reduced some fat mass in a dieting phase. So um, leptin is secreted from fat cells. So if we've reduced the number of fat cells we've had, we've also reduced our capacity to secrete leptin. So that's one part of it. Um, we see an increase in the um, in ghrelin, which is our hunger hormone. Um, and we also see um, some other metabolic turndown. So we see some implications with thyroid hom- hormone. This is less likely to be a seven-day thing. This is more likely to be dieting over, like extreme dieting over 
a few months that mm-hmm. we see the sort of the, the sort of heavier hitting hormones like thyroid hormone, cortisol um, coming into play. Um, for men, reducing their energy intake and, and for women as well, we de- definitely see a turn down in testosterone production. So we've got somebody who might have been quite vital eating adequate calories, um, able to go train, um, energy to train, energy to build lean muscle mass um, and engage in everyday activity, halve their energy intake, um, their drive to eat increases, their will to move <laughs> decreases. Yeah, tough gig, isn't it? So, you know, that's another part of it is the adaptive, uh, you know, uh, one of the adaptations to dieting is – I don't feel like moving spontaneously as much. So the output, energy output actually decreases because our body is trying to meet what we're giving it. It's trying to meet the budget. So we're trying to run our body on a budget that's 50% of what it was last week. Um, our will to train gets reduced because we just don't have that um, – we don't have the energy to dedicate to the cause. Our brain function is is compromised because we don't have enough glucose running it. Um, There's that word. Glucose. Dun, dun, dun. Dietitian on board. Dietitian on board. Um, you know, so we see all these metabolic turndowns in order to conserve energy, in order to be able to meet, you know, the minimum requirements to stay alive. Um and if we stay down there, you know, long term, um, you know, and there's also the, the, the we run the risk long term that we're not consuming enough nutrients to meet our minimum health requirements as well. So there's a bit of a picture here when we're we're. Um, what type of nutrients are you talking about there? Your micro. Yeah, your yeah. micronutrients, yeah. even your macronutrients as well. So we're reducing our protein intake. We're reducing our will to train. Um, you know, we're compromising our lean muscle mass as well. And again, that has a flow-on effect of a sort of slight metabolic turn down as well. Can you summarise this for us? Like, there's a lot of things you've talked about there, ups and downs, hormones here and there, you know, the need to take like a shred or a pre-workout and a multivitamin during your life. I get, I got all that message. I'm getting a death stares now from everyone, but that's the message I got from that. But why, <laughs> why do people put them on work? Let's let's wrap this up. Where are we at? So look, we see we see um, our body's adaptation. We we basically turning down any ex- excess movement, um, hormonal um, functions in our body are reduced to meet the amount of energy that we're taking in. Um, we tend to see people go through sort of a binge and restrict cycle. So they restrict, 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 and then they'll crack it and they'll end up eating double and yep. they'll essentially be undoing any calorie deficit that they might have achieved. Um, they, you know, when we're doing highly restrictive eating patterns, we haven't actually addressed their lifestyle. We haven't addressed addressed their relationship with food. We haven't um, addressed food quality. They might be working off a very – um, one-dimensional diet template which doesn't give them the tools to nuance you know their understanding of nutrition um, and we tend to see this sort of cycle of restricting and then overeating breeding a poor relationship with food and their body that's a big thing a poor relationship with food oh isn't it? it's it's can i touch on that one. before we jump into what would a successful diet look like yeah so just hitting on that that binge restrict cycle where been good for weeks and weeks and then I, I'm just having that day. Yep. You know, I go stuff it, I'm going to have the cheesecake. I'll yep. stuff I'm going to go out that night and I'm going to have six rum and cokes. Yep. Or hang on, there's a kebab on the way home. <laughs> you know, like just real living. Everybody so, loves a 2 a.m. <coughs> kebab, yeah, Greg. <laughs> that can work both ways for you, that one. That can purge or – so what I want, want to know is I've done that and I've eaten a hell of a lot of calories. I've drunk a lot of calories. Mm. How bad is that to the binge? Can I come back tomorrow and, and – move forward or am I most likely I've done like have I done that much damage from that one blowout like we talk about this binge this binge restricts like I assume means you don't go on a one day binge or you go on a several day binge and you go mm. oh I did it yesterday who cares I'll do it tomorrow or yeah. it's Thursday I'll start my diet on Monday yeah is is that the bad part is that one meal really blowing me out the door no that's, no. that's the problem here so get so over it have fun move on the, is that what you're saying I, I say this to people the yeah. faster you can move on from that scenario the better off you everybody has scenarios and when we look at the definition of binge eating there's there's you know the the, the binge eating that is, you know, a clinical term and then there's the 
you know, in one sitting having overeaten an uncomfortable amount of food which may or may not – look, we've got the binge that makes you feel guilty, that has shame attached to it, that yeah. is probably two, 3,000 calories no in one sitting. It was no shame at 2 a.m. in the morning just so you know. Yeah. No, shame. no shame. Especially when you've had a couple of bourbons. Yeah. Zero shame. Yeah. Um, but, but then we've got the scenario where you might have been to a, a big dinner and eaten, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of food. Uh, you know, it might be a 1,000 calories extra as opposed to a day's worth of calories and – a lot of shame and guilt. So I think, you know, looking at the binge in a couple of different... Um, the body's smarter than that though, isn't it? It knows this is abnormal. Look, if it's if it's one sitting... I mean, the sooner people can stop labelling food and themselves as good or bad um, because of what they've eaten, it means that I can get up tomorrow. I've had my cheesecake. I've had my burger. It oh, was I enjoyable. Burger. There was a burger. It was enjoyable. Um <clears throat> if I've got a positive relationship with food and I haven't labelled that burger as toxic or bad or now I'm a bad person for having eaten it, I can get up, have my breakfast and get on with my life. Here's a big question for you. Say I have been on my restricted calorie diet like you're talking about. Yes. And I've had a binge. Yep. What should my next morning look like? I think it should just look like the mornings where… Of every other day. Of every other day. Yep. Because I, when… Look… Now, I want to explain this to people. Like you've had the binge, you've naughty, you're probably not feeling the best because you've had a few drinks in the yep. top of it. So just get back into the routine again. Get back into the routine. When you're starting out, just getting back into the routine. Like if you, you can nuance your approach, if you're a competent eater, if you're somebody who has a positive relationship with food, who understands nutrition and that all foods are appropriate at any one time, you might be able to shuffle around your food a little bit. But for most people who will for the most part, aren't competent eaters at this stage, just eat your normal breakfast because, you know, when we start restricting the next day, that's just starting the cycle again. Don't panic um, because you're going to get hungry and then you're going to snap again. Like it's just it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in some cases if people are competent, they might choose to, you know, shuffle their calories and have a lighter breakfast knowing that they're going to have a bigger dinner. Yep. But that takes a bit of skill and a bit of foresight and a bit of um, you know, competence yep. to be able to do that stuff without it becoming three days of fasting leading into a big dinner and it becoming like quite a negative thing. You know, it. I think the the feeling behind the, the action is what's most important. What's driving the person to do it is the most important thing. But long and short, if you've had a big, big day, you know, eating, just get yeah, back. Jog on. Just jog on, mate. Yeah. It's, you know, when we're you know, chastising, chastising ourselves for eating foods, it, it's just really creating a very negative cycle that – it, it's very hard to break. Yeah, nice. So let, let, let's stop talking about the bottom half of the glass. Let's talk about the top half. Mm. What would a successful weight loss attempt look like? I've come to see you, Harriet, and I want to lose a few kilos. Yeah. So we've had a conversation, Greg, um, in this scenario, this hypothetical scenario, and we've um, come to a an agreement where we've got a sensible time frame we have a sensible rate. We've chunked down the goal. So if you came to me and said, I want to lose 20 kilos, that's super overwhelming. I'm going to say, let's start with three. Okay. <laughs> now imagine, you know, losing Can three. Can I ask why? Because it's mentally. Have you ever started a really big project and procrastinated on it because it's so big that you just didn't even know where to start and you just didn't do anything about it? No. Wrong person to ask. Um, Except my 20 kilo challenge I've got going. Okay, yes. but it's it's overwhelming. Every Friday, every Friday it becomes overwhelming. It is overwhelming, like 20 kilos, that's going to take me forever. But if I can get you some short wins on the board, build up your confidence, your eating competence. So project management and diet management are exactly the exactly same. Exactly the okay, same thing. Okay, nice. We a are, lot of us are very good at project management, so let's think about that. Think of your health as a project. It yeah. is a long-term project with a very dire deadline, but... That's, you know, that's just down the track. Um, but, you know, we've we've got a structure. We've decided that we're going to sensibly reduce your intake. So what are our expectations if we're being sensible? Um, well, we're looking at the foods that you're currently eating. We've, uh, you know, we've reviewed your current dietary intake and I might have identified that every night you're having 
five beers, six because they come in a six pack. So let's be honest, you're not going to leave one in the fridge. Um, you're having a six pack every night. Um, and that actually, if we could reduce that down to two initially, then that's an extra 400 calories, 500 calories that you're not consuming each night. We've just knocked down, you know, uh, your intake without having you to even touch your food. So it's important to look at what the individual is doing. We want to make sure that their goal is realistic, that their time frame is realistic because unfortunately with the TV shows that we have where they're losing three, four, five, six kilos in a week, I'm bringing it back down with a lot of my clients and saying if you're losing 250 grams of fat in a week, happy days. That's a win because I want your expectation to be achievable and I want you to feel like you're getting some runs on the board initially. We can we can change the goalposts as we go, but in those first three, four, five weeks, it's about establishing sustainable habits. It's about cutting out the low hanging fruit, the six pack of beer, yep. cutting cutting that down. That's a low hanging fruit. The soft drink, low hanging. Every second fruit. Friday night, outside of every Friday night. Absolutely, yeah. you know there are a lot of low hanging fruit that people don't even look at. They so go straight the for the jugular. Yep, and <laughs> we don't want to go straight for the jugular initially. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've, you know, we're looking at zero, like one percent body fat, one percent body weight a week as a, you know, as a pretty big target. Um, you know, half to one percent of your body weight in a week is is good going. So, so from a mental perspective, should people think of it as a percentage of body weight or as a kilo? Like, how should we do this? It's, well, I mean, the percentage makes it relative to the person. Um, mm. it, it depends. Like, if if it's a hundred and ten kilo person, and that's you know, 10% of their body weight is 11%. That's, you know, they're, they're looking at a kilo a week. Yep. And, you know, relative to the size of the person, that might be realistic. But if I'm working with someone who's shorter and who's smaller, you know, that's going to be a lot of weight. So, so percentages, the 1% rule. percentages can work um, work quite well because they make it relative to the person. Okay. Um, you know, but again, yeah, it just depends. Um how we're working with that that person. So is that one percent reassessed every week at the new weight, or are you talking the one percent of the original weight? Um, Just can, for those people out there, they're going to ring me and ask me. Well, look, you you would have to recalibrate that okay, as we so go it's along. A, it's a new one percent each week. Well, look, you, you can. It's not going to be an exact science either. No. You know, with weight loss, we've got a, a good ballpark figure about what we're aiming for. Um, and if we've, you know, we've decided that four kilos is going to get them to the point where they're happier and better able to live their lives and, you know, we can reassess it as we go along. Um, but it's not going to be an exact science. No, I get that. Totally get that. I think most people get that too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. what about the person that comes home every night and has a glass of wine while they're cooking dinner or they're doing that type of thing? Would you be in, in what does a successful weight loss attempt look like? Well, would that be one of the things you're saying to people, let's try and take that out before you change foods and do all the other things? Look, uh, that could be... Not a chronic, like six packs extreme. I don't know yeah. many, many people that drink six beers every night, but like that one glass of wine. Look, that could be a lever that you pull. I, I don't like wine. If you think I'm talking about me, everyone, I'm not a wine drinker. No, but, not a wine drinker. No, no look, th- you know, I'm looking at the entirety of their food habits. Yep. And if that glass of wine is a lever we can pull without it being, you know, too stressful, it, that could be a good approach. But mm-hmm. it also might be the banana bread that they absentmindedly consume at morning tea. So we might not have to touch the wine, you know. Obviously drinking alcohol in excess is not ideal and but it has its own problems. A lot of but people I know will train four to five times a week. Yep. Um, they eat, I hate the word clean eating because I don't really know the definition of it, but they eat fair, what they call fairly clean, which I mean – I guess that means they use nice ingredients and cool, beautiful colours and stuff. Yeah, all that made at home. Stuff. But a lot of them, you know, high-end executives and they'll have a glass of wine when they get home at night. It's just so... It's a wine down. Yeah, so if you're... Oh, nicely put. If you're looking at someone like that, mm-hmm. wh- where are you going to go first? Are you going to say, let's reduce serve sizes? Because I want to know what a, a successful weight lo- what it looks like. Mm. Or are you going to go straight to, let's be honest, you're drinking calories, let's move on from that. Yeah. Is that, are you going to be really hard on us with people or are you going to, let's take a look, like look, most of those people aren't having that, what do you call it, um, banana cake or yeah, 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 whatever yeah, you said. Yeah, yeah. Look, because it's got the word cake attached to it and I think that's a bad food because we've already classified that as bad earlier. Yep. So 
if if I've assessed their diet with them in conjunction with them and we've identified that that glass of wine doesn't actually pose any meaningful benefit to their diet, then that could be something that goes. Yep. You know, and, you know, we might look at other ways of relaxing after work in order without having to, you know, go towards alcohol to do that. And that's an important thing to identify is that, okay, lifestyle factor is obviously playing a big thing in here. If you need two glasses of wine of an evening to wind down, excuse the pun, um, we need to look at lifestyle factors as well, which, again, is something that I assess with people and, you know, if you're doing your job properly, you're assessing their lifestyle factors and getting a really good understanding of what are some of the underlying stresses or yep. pressure points for these people as well. Because when you look at a traditional poured glass of wine at any type of social event, it's not one glass of wine anymore, is it? You've got a standard drink yeah. is definitely not <laughs> a standard drink yeah. anymore. Most glasses of wine you'll get poured are probably one and a half standard drinks. So yep. 100 mils um, – is around the amount of alcohol. I think it's 10 grams of alcohol in a standard drink. Um, and then you multiply that up by the percentage um, of the alcohol that you're consuming. So like of a spirit is obviously going to be a smaller serve size than say like a light beer. You can drink more but still get that standard drink in there. Um, and is that something you do like someone who really wants their beer at night? We're talking about what is a good uh, an yeah. attempt. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's stop the heavy beer and jump on light beer. Is that something that you might? That could be a tool yeah. that we use 100%. So would 100%. I be drinking white wine or red wine? I don't, uh, I don't like wine. Minutia yeah. in that one there. Yeah. Like I think it would be, I mean, you know, if we're pulling it, you know, the red wine might have a slightly higher antioxidant factor than white wine. But, again, that's probably cherry picking a little bit and saying look, let's look at the overall habit there. Because I'm going to heat you up for chocolate later. So, yep. yeah, so we'll. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, it's it's figuring out what, again, what are the low-hanging fruit? How can we ca- create a calorie deficit that will allow you to lose weight in a gradual manner without totally overriding your lifestyle and making it so restrictive you can't stick to it? And I can see by the questions, Mark, when you're rolling your eyes, like, oh, here we go, here he goes again. But I'm, I'm not trying to be a smart ass, which I know you think I am. What I'm trying to get here is you've got a lot of people that say, hey, I'm training, I'm doing this, and I'm not, just not losing weight, you know. Yeah. But then you go – do you drink? No, I don't drink. Like one drink. Yeah. They, yeah, yeah they don't yeah, even yeah, tell you about yeah, the one wine, but they do. They have one wine at night when they come home and it yeah. just might be when they're making dinner for the kids. It's yeah. their half an hour of power. Yeah. So. Honest conversations are super yeah. important to, to working with people. So if we dropped a glass of wine out of our. Yep. That might be 100 seven calories week, gone. 100 calories. So you're talking potentially over a week, 700 calories. Yep. Yeah. So. Which is going to make a dent. Hmm. It's not going to be the overall thing, but I think very frequently people aren't aware of the the energy content of a lot of foods. Yeah. So they Same might be eating. like the flat white drinkers too because they're having a fair chunk of milk in a flat white, aren't they? Well, yeah, but if, if, if that's in context of their, their daily nutrition intake, you know, that's fine. That might be a, totally appropriate because milk's also got a good chunk of protein in there, calcium, it's satisfying first thing in the morning. So it might be the answer. If they're having a large caramel latte, I would be looking at that, but I'd also be looking at, um, you know, where can we cut from? Where can we create a calorie deficit from without completely ruining their quality of life and their enjoyment? Yeah, absolutely. You got to live. Yeah, Yeah, because I love my my flat white. If anyone takes that away from me, daggers. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I saw you have one this morning. You did have a small though. You didn't have a large. Yeah, look, some days it's a large. Let's be honest. Some days it is. Some days it's a triple shot. Don't enjoy your body signs. You need a small one. So, okay, so we've talked about drinking your calories. We've talked about 1%. A good diet is looking at 1%. Yeah. What else are we looking at here that we need to do? And you're not talking, you haven't mentioned I've halved calories yet. No. So we want to not halve our calories. Wow, you're off trend. I'm so off trend. Um, what are we talking about? What is your Instagram account while we're talking about off trend? At Athletic Eating. So that's my little that's Instagram your new one, account. That's a newie since last time we spoke to you, isn't Athletic it? Athletic Eating. I've dropped the Harriet Walker off there. Wow. Just a little bit of anonymity, you know, yeah. never killed anyone. Um, <laughs> that's keystrokes. Yeah, we all love it. That's exactly it. I don't get told off by Greg for having a <laughs> handle that's too long. So we're still enjoying our social occasions. You you know, let's look at that drink. Let's look at changing the type of drink we do. Yep. We're one percenting calories. What are we doing? Look, we want to be able to create a dent in our maintenance level of calories. And I say this because I've been around you a lot in some athletic populations recently where you – 
some people have wanted to lose a little bit of weight with you and you've put them on more calories. Yeah. You said, we're going to hurt for a week or two. No, I'm lying. It was a month or two, but we're going to come back yep. at the end of it. So can we talk about that side of things? So this comes down to, I mean, really commonly um, when people have reduced their calories so heavily, there's nowhere to go. Um, they actually don't, like we can't reduce their calories any lower. Um, and what's happened in many cases. What type of calories you got people coming into you at in this scenario? Oh, eight, nine thousand calories. Yeah, 900 calories, 1,000 calories, 1,200 calories. Wow. Um, and we're talking people who are doing one, two, three hours of training a, a day. Weapons. Gee, they must be sucking some. It's fruit, really common. Some... It is super common. Like I think I am giving people more calories than less calories. But what we don't understand, what, what gets missed in many cases, is that if you're training and you're not consuming enough energy to be able to uh, maximize the adaptations, and when I say adaptations, basically build off what you've done, training is a stimulus. If you're not giving your body extra building blocks to um, cash in on that stimulus, you might have had a really great plot of um, land come on a beachfront you know, area that never comes up. But if you don't have the capital, the cash to build on that block of land, you've totally missed out. Yeah, gotcha. So if you're training and you're trying to do, you know, build some lean muscle mass, if you're under eating, your body's probably turned down all the metabolic um, processes that are associated with building yeah. and we're cutting we're cutting down. Everything's on slow-mo, yeah. um, not scomo. Um, okay. So I, I took us a bit off track there. We're talking about what does a good diet look like. So what are you doing with people? Like someone comes into you, you're, you're, you're assessing what, a couple of days of eating. How do you actually work out how many calories someone's consuming? Well, I mean. Because let's be honest, we're not telling you the truth. No. Well, I do ask people to be as honest and as accurate as possible. So yeah. I have to assume in some cases that it's not going to be completely accurate. But yeah. a food diary, I'll, I'll get people to use um, an app to do that, um, to track, and I can actually have a look at it for them. Mm -hmm. um, three days is the minimum that you can kind of get a gist of what they're eating. And in many okay. cases, I'm just looking for a gist yep. of what they're eating. I'm not taking what they've given me as gospel, but yep. it gives me a pretty good idea of saying, look, general consensus here is that you're under eating or general consensus is you're consuming nuts, which are really healthy for you but you're having 500 grams a day yeah, and that's gotcha. really popping you over your calorie budget. Yeah. So that might be the point at which I start them. Okay, we're going to reduce that down. So I don't want to halve their calories. You know, that could get them somewhere weight loss really quickly. Is that good quality weight loss? Probably not. It's probably okay. going to be a lot of muscle mass as well as fat mass yep. and loss of joy. Um I'm going to be cr trying to create a calorie deficit that's sustainable that they will probably not notice too much. Um, so it might be changing, you know, from, um, you know, a, a large coffee to a small coffee. That yep. might be for somebody that's appropriate. But for other people, they might say, no, bugger off. I'm not doing that. I'll sacrifice So time. we're negotiating. It's a negotiation. I'm not telling people what yep. to do. I'm working with them, looking at what they're currently doing and negotiating changes with them that they can agree to and that they can actually achieve in order to get a calorie deficit that's going to allow for that weight loss that they can do consistently, but also allows them to exercise with good intensity and with, you know, joy. <laughs> so this environment of change support that you create... Yes. How successful is that in, in real life? Look, it's, it's important. I don't know if you ever made a change. Um, I know personally like when I was dieting for my bodybuilding competitions way back when, when I started telling my mates at the time, you know, I was a uni student, so rock and roll lifestyle, goon bags. Yeah. No, I never drank from – well, maybe I did once or twice. But anyway, I digress. When I said to them that I wasn't going to be drinking – a lot in the next six months, I got I got like ah oh, yeah give you not very supportive at all because yeah, okay. I've they've lost their drinking buddy. Yep. So every time you make a change in your life, somebody's going to be mourning that role that you're playing for them. Might be your cake eating buddy. It might have been your drinking buddy. It yeah. might have been your 
Netflix and Chill Buddy. Yeah, gotcha. Different connotations. But um, we need to make sure that we have people who are on our team, mm-hmm. that we have that support ne- mechanism behind them. So do we tell people, is it successful to tell people, hey, I'm I'm on a fitness it depends. Goal, I'm dieting. What, what what do we do? We tell like we're looking at the things that create a good diet. Yeah. Do do we communicate that or do we just go? I'm not telling anyone. I'm just going to uh, keep doing what look, I'm doing. There there would be some significant people that it would be useful to tell mm-hmm. because you want their support. They're yep. the people that you see day to day who will actually be assisting you with this. Yep. Then there's the people you probably don't want to tell, like your workmates, who are unless they're like good blokes and good chicks, um, sometimes people can be pretty crappy when the, and it's, yeah, gotcha. you yep. know, they, they, it can be sabotaging. Like, yep. oh, go on, Julie, have another piece of cake. You know, yeah. oh, I want to hurt you. Oh, you're being good today. Ooh. <laughs> that says more about them than it does about you. But yep. in some cases, I think it's better just to keep to yourself and do your thing and knuckle down with a few good people, you know, a few good crew. So should we be keeping in this um – this environment should we be keeping some type of journal or log or something? Yeah, of what look we're doing? for some people a journal can ha- make them more mindful of what they're doing. And mindfulness is a word that gets bandied around <laughs> a lot. It's a power word. It's a power word. Um, but when applied in uh, in a way, it is it is super effective. Just being aware, awareness is such a big thing. Like I do things sometimes where I'm like, I had no idea I was like accidentally. You know, every time I went to the petrol station, I was getting a Freddo frog. Or, you know, that's the sort of stuff you're like, oh, okay, I can see what you're saying now. I I was aware, but I wasn't aware. So, you know, journaling for people can be a way of peaking their awareness. Okay. You know, food diaries aren't always necessary, <coughs> but they can be for some people a useful tool. Yep. Um, you know, monitoring trends and actually identifying. And that's something you can take back to, you know, a dietitian or your trainer and be like, oh, hey, guess what, I just realised that every Wednesday night when the kids are going to hockey that I get a bucket of hot chips. And you're like, okay, this week this is something that we could be like, okay, instead of getting a bucket of hot chips, let's let's take some snacks along that you're going to enjoy but aren't a bucket of hot chips and we've saved you Wow, we'll, we'll put a list calories. at the bottom of this podcast of alternatives for a bucket of hot chips that are enjoyable snacks. <laughs> Wow. It's going to be a short list that one. Uh, I'll get back to you. On, I'll get back to you on that. Ooh. It's mindset though, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. mindset and it's support network as well and environment, behavior change, upskilling. You know your knowledge about nutrition. The, the which pe- let's be honest is in most people is average or driven from bits of stuff they want to read. Yeah, like a blog. Yeah, they might follow somebody and that's where they get their information from. And that's why it's important for people who are putting information out there that they make it the best quality information that they know how. You know, not everyone's going to have a degree qualification, but we do need to make sure that people are being responsible with the information they're putting out. As a minimum, just being aware that people are consuming that. Yeah, I mean, all types of information is good information. You've got to take it the right way and do the right thing with it. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about all that. Let's look at some lifestyle factors. I mean, is that an area you guys play in? Oh, it is. a Well, where lifestyle impacts the way in which people eat, it's a, such a big factor. It is such a big factor. We don't just eat in a vacuum. <laughs> I eat while I'm vacuuming, but I don't eat in a vacuum. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah, negative mm-hmm. calories. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in lifestyle factors play a really big part of it. So, you know, if you've Let's got, hit the big two, sleep and stress. So... That is a big two and that those are two really big drivers for the way in which we eat. So, you know, there's information research to show that when we're not sleeping adequately that we see an increase in the hormones associated. In the same way when we reduce our calories, we see that drive to eat. We see the same response um, when we have l- not in- inadequate sleep patterns. So we get that increased drive to eat, um, increased cravings for the sort of sugary high energy foods to sort of help boost our energy um when we're not feeling that crash hot um and in the and sleep- how much sleep a night are we talking like if we're dropping from you know if we're having seven hours or five hours is there a massive difference in what Look, you're talking about there you know the u-shaped curve we see with you know training adaptation it's an upside down u it's the same we can apply that same principle with sleep so there is an optimal at the top of the u over that amount of sleep, we tend to see decrements in health 
And then on the other side, too little sleep, we see decrements in health and uh, lifestyle outcomes and all that kind of gig. So I think where they're landing at the moment, um, and this is based off something I've read just recently, there there is a bit of a happy medium. Some people are going to fall outside of the bell curve. Um, so some people can get by on five hours sleep and be fine in the same way that some people can get nine, ten hours of sleep and, you know, be fine as well. For the most part, we're looking at that seven to eight hours as being the sweet spot. There will be outliers, but that's really where we're looking at. So oversleeping can have, you know, downsides just as undersleeping can too. You yeah, know, I, I won't go on about textbook worries, but I was talking with Summer last night about sleep, which you didn't buy. Yeah. I made. And she was quoting some of the new stats coming out in relation to sleep. And I yep. was blown away by yeah. where, where that's going. Like it's going to impact a lot of industries. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. You know, and it's a safety thing as well. Yeah. You know, when we're not sleeping properly, we do see that sort of equivalent of, you know, 0.05 blood alcohol level. It's It really does impact well-being um, and it certainly does impact food choices. And now let's talk about stress and, and possibly, you know, in, in – in the world that I live in, a lot more anxiety coming out in people um, and, you know, in, in a joking way and in a serious way too. You know, like people go to me, oh, Greg, you're playing with my anxiety levels. Like that's just a back the fuck off type thing. I get that. But then there's true anxiety where people wake up nervous anxiety like about what, what could happen. Mm. What's that doing with weight loss? Look, the direct link between sort of mental health and weight, there's a couple of different branches to it. Um I, I think that would probably deserve um, talking to someone else, talking to yeah, someone else, that. but also uh, a different podcast, like a whole nother topic on that link. Because and if you are suffering anxiety, people give Lifeline a call. They've got some great resources to have a chat to. About. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is it care is care of Dan Con there ambassador. Is, there is a you know, educated me up. A definite um, requirement to to look at that aspect of it. But um, at a top level, you know, we can see when we're not balanced. From, as a result of stress in life and we you know we're not, not making the best food choices where, you know, we might be making convenience food choices or we might be eating foods sort of more towards comfort eating rather than eating for, you know, long-term good health. <coughs> so, you know, sleep and stress um, certainly do – stress eating is, is certainly a thing and I, you know – encouraging people to seek out um, tools that are non-food related in some aspects. Look, we, you know, it's, it is it is fine to comfort eat every now and then. Yeah. But when it becomes a crutch as a, because there's something that you're not addressing in your lifestyle, then that's when we need to be sort of bringing other people on board to assist with that. And it certainly does impact people's eating behaviours. So let's step away from that. So let's talk about the person who's on a big project time time deprived they are doing their training each week they're they're eating their diet properly they're probably not having as much sleep because when you come to the end of a project you tend to have the last five percent's a lot bigger than the last five percent yep you know what are those people suffering from a weight loss perspective like they're still hitting hitting the gym they're still doing everything they can but they're just busy all day Look, if they're still managing... Which is your, your typical executive? Yeah, look, if they're still managing to eat well and train well, the, the one thing that might be factored in there is that their sedentary behaviour has increased quite drastically. I know for myself, unless I'm monitoring my steps, I can if I'm not hitting 10,000 steps, I'm hitting 500 steps because I'm sitting down at my desk every single day, which means that all of a sudden I've gone from burning... So this is our non-exercise yep. activity thermogenesis, um, one of those buckets that we can expend energy from. They they might be sitting down f- for, uh, you know, they might be not expending 300 calories a day where they used to. So that's the difference between, um, you know, when I'm up and moving and I'm actively trying to get my steps in. If I don't have time to do that, all of a sudden my energy expenditure has gone from, you know, a thousand calories a day to 600 calories a day, multiply that out. And that's going to be yeah, spelling, exactly, yeah. you know, weight gain as well. So, you know, we're not just looking at structured exercise. Put a glass of wine on top of that. I put a, yeah, put a couple of extra. You've added a day of calories, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's, it's, it, they're little subtle things like that, but especially when we're stressed, we're time poor. I think the non-exercise component of um, movement suffers, their sedentary behavior increases, and that really plays into that, um, 
you know, potential to gain weight. I know when I went from being a student who was, you know, in hospitality part time, studying part or full time, walking around easily doing 15,000 steps a day, you know, if I do a shift at a cafe or yeah, restaurant, exactly. yep. I, you know, it was an easy two kilos in the first 12 months of having finished school and going into office work. That's just how it happens. So, you know, those, the sedentary behavior is just as, plays just a bigger role in, you know, fluctuations in weight um, as exercise and diet. Good advice. Thanks. I know when I'm traveling a lot like planes, hotels, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I mean, unless you're in Melbourne Airport, that's an easy one and a half kilometer round trip. So that's great. (laughs) (laughs) It's a big airport, isn't it? Yeah, it's tiring. Do we we want to um, go back and just a successful weight loss? weight loss attempt would look like yep. ABC? I've got a I've got a list that I put together and this is like I ask my clients this at the end sort of of what we've been doing just nice. to give them a checklist of things. I've I've pulled it together. It's not rocket science. There's probably other lists similar to this. But what I see, success, people who have successfully maintained a healthy weight for a long period of time, what are some of the habits and what are some of the behaviours and the skills that they have? Let's do this. So the first one is their food choices are based on um, healthy choices. So unprocessed, homemade food, um, lots of colour, lean protein, healthy fats, slow bu- slow burning carbohydrates. Eighty percent of their food choices, and that's a fairly generic number, but the majority of their food choices are coming from the foods that are going to be serving them well. Mm-hmm. That's one. So they're not doing 100%, but they're not doing 50% either. Yeah. So it's like 80%, you know, it's a nice little little number. Um, they're not banning food groups. They can successfully have one line of chocolate in a block and not feel the need to, because they've labelled that food as bad, they're not going to be like, stuff it, I'm going to have the whole block. Yep, okay. So they can successfully consume a small appropriate portion of food because they haven't labelled it good, bad. It's just something they enjoy. Like it. Um, because they've done some work around their food beliefs and they've they've identified what their favourite foods are and they might have cut out some of the other inconsequential foods they don't really enjoy. Um, so they, they can eat for enjoyment without feeling guilty. Yep. Um, and that really goes a long way to breaking that binge um, cycle that we see. Um, and they don't see consuming those foods that aren't necessarily healthy per se. They don't see that as a failure. It's something that they do on a regular basis because they enjoy it and they've left the guilt behind. So that's a nice. really big one. Um a uh, majority of their food is prepared at home um, and they also are aware of healthier convenience options. So we're talking about plan A's and plan B's. A little bit of Uber B's. research. A little bit little of Uber, Uber research. research. What is in your environment that you know that if you haven't prepared food, if you've gotten back from a work trip and you didn't go shopping, what is in your immediate environment that you can access? And they've they've got a plan B that is not plan A, but it's better than we don't, we don't really want to pick a particular <laughs> brand of anything there. <laughs> it's but not takeaway food. It's not the purest convenience form available, yep. may not be the best. Yeah, yes. yep, it's not fried food. So yep. there's a continuum of optimal and terrible and they haven't gone from optimal to terrible. They've gone from optimal to second best op- option yep. because they've put some forethought into that. So the next one is food is not a part of their identity. What do you mean by that? Now, this is a funny one. Um, I find when people really identify with how they eat, it becomes quite emotional and it can really cloud their judgment as to what they're doing. Um, I'm a this, this is what I do. If you're leading with I'm, oh, a, I'm a carnivore, I'm a this, vegan or I'm a, you mean that type of thing? You know, okay, yeah. it really, that the way you eat shouldn't be, you know, your most pertinent thing about you, yep. I, I think. And it, it can lead to people being quite distressed if they eat in a way that deviates from that identity, gotcha. that's distressing. Yeah, gotcha. Fair enough. That's a good point. So they eat in a way that serves them and that suits them, yep. but it's not the leading, hi, I'm Harriet and I'm a dot, dot, dot. Yep. You know, yeah. Because we're just you know, reducing a bit of that distress, that cognitive dissonance if they eat in a way that's not how they think they eat. Nice. Um, so sleep is prioritised over binge watching TV and scrolling through. So people very commonly... You mean social media when you say scrolling through? Yeah, 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 scrolling. Yep. 
not just eating scrolls, that too. Okay. Um, but, you know, we Did you think of Vegemite scrolls then? Your oh, eyes rolled back. You thought of something. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> it was a berry scroll. With a berry scroll. Okay. I saw it in your <laughs> eyes. Food is not part of your identity. That was the previous one. So sleep, sleep and social media. Yeah. So, you know, we're prioritizing sleep and, you know, as we discussed, r- lack of sleep really does lead to some pretty big things. Yep. Um, if dietary wise, dietary choices wise. So if we can prioritize our sleep, make sure that we're getting to bed on time, we can really roll back on some of those um, less optimal choices. Mm-hmm. Um, coffee is enjoyed, um, and but it's not relied upon to get through the day. So I am such a big caffeine fan. Yeah, I I'm love it. Call bullshit on that one, but no, I'm only joking. <laughs> I'm a I'm a user. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a long-term user. As you but, said, coffee's enjoyed. It's not – don't look at it negatively. Yeah, positively, but if but you're on your, your sixth day and you're like struggling, that's a yeah. red flag to me to say, hey, what's going on balance-wise in your yeah. life? You need to get some more sleep. Yeah, maybe you're thirsty. Basically, maybe you're thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Hungry, thirsty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's there to be enjoyed. It's not a crutch. Yep. Um, alcohol is enjoyed, but it's not essential to having a good time or to deal with um, life issues yeah, okay. or to de-stress. Yep. You know, alcohol can be fun, 100%. But when you're, you know, using it because life's a bit too hectic, we need to deal with life and then peel back a little bit on that. So... That's important. Um, exercise is enjoyable and it's done on the regular, but it's not a punishment. Um, it's an enjoyable okay, part of your lifestyle. Okay, because I'm going to go train is a bad yeah, way yeah, to think. Yeah, yeah got yeah, you. Not. That's exactly I train because I love training. Yeah, 100%. Nice. And it makes me feel good and yeah, perfect. Up, you know, all those good things. Um, and training or planned exercise is seen as an important part of achieving goals, but missing a session due to illness or injury or to connect with others doesn't cause distress. And that's a big one as well. So... I'm all for training. I love training. I'd do three sessions a day. Yeah. Not because I feel the need to, you know, burn excess calories. I actually genuinely love the stuff. Just love lifting heavy shit. Love lifting heavy shit. Love going for a run, you know, love pulling a skier. Uh, You lift heavy stuff and you go for a run. I know. Don't tell my strong friends. They all... That will kick me out of the circle. <laughs> I wasn't in the circle in the first place. So let's be honest, I'm just peering through like a creep. No, I'm joking. So that's a really <laughs> cool list of successful things. Can we put that at the bottom of the podcast? Yeah. So that's so a that's- tick box that I use with people and that it's a tool that you can go back to and be like, all right, everything's going a bit haywire. I'm going to go back to this list and go, what am I doing currently? And then whatever's left over is what you can work on. Wow. And that's that's the, the culmination of my my six years of – study i like that's it. what i've come up with <laughs> I'm really good. i think that's excellent yeah so it's it's something you can go back to um every so time. you want to be author is this where you're going with this look if it's a 50 word document i'm an author <laughs> I'm a pub- am i a Finished. published author now can i put that in my instagram it profile pr- it is printed yeah <laughs> i don't know why i didn't think of this earlier thanks for pointing it out Look, I think you've touched on some great points there. We will put them below the podcast on the website, bodyscience.com.au forward slash podcast. We might dude. even throw it in our article section too with a nice picture of Harriet above it or something. Yeah, we have to get a nice one first, but that we can work on that. We should probably turn this into something bigger if you ever want to and, and do some more, pat it out a bit and put some pills around it and Absolutely. some cool stuff. Because, I mean, that's great advice. Hmm. Well, we've had Harriet on. You did the intro. Let's You want to exit? Let's go. Let's hear your exit. Well, uh, thanks for having me, Greg. You've been listening to the Body Science Podcast at the House of Fit, Happy, Healthy. Um, Today's podcast was brought to you by Clean Coffee, single origin Arabica uh, coffee. Label reading. Label reading. (laughs) I would have said hydroxy burn shred, but you know what? We're not going to argue over which supplement's better for you. We all have our favourites. We all have our favourites, Greg. We do. Um, Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure having you on the show today. (laughs) And I look forward to having you back next time. Fantastic. Over now. Today's podcast was brought to you by our partners in Fit, Happy and Healthy, ASN, Nutrition Warehouse, DY Discount Vitamins, Fat Burners Only, Evelyn Fay, Mr. Supplement, or find a retailer online at bodyscience.com.au forward slash retailers.